Hi there, I'm Dermot. And I'm Shannon. Welcome back to another episode of Understanding the Sacraments. We're here in the Matter Hospital for our discussion with Father Dominic about the Sacrament of the Sick. Understanding the Sacraments is a seven-part series that takes an in-depth look at all seven sacraments in the Catholic Church. Baptism. Eucharist. Confirmation. Reconciliation. Anointing the Sick. Marriage. And Holy Orders. In each episode, we'll be joined by Father Dominic McGrattan. Father Dominic is chaplain to Queen's University Belfast, former hospital chaplain and assistant priest here in St Bridget's. Sacraments are a celebration of our journey as a Catholic and our relationship with God. What do we mean by the anointing of the sick and why is it necessary? Well, none of us lives forever and we all need a saviour. As the church teaches, every illness can make us glimpse death. We cannot save ourselves and we cannot heal ourselves. The realisation of our own physical limitations and our mortality can be a blessing in that we better come to know and trust in the ultimate power of God. Now, the sacrament of the sick provides help on two fronts. The first is to restore us to physical health if that is what God wills. The second is to help us transition from this life to the next once our earthly lives have run their course. The oil of the sick is essential for anointing and a priest should always carry on his person a small stock and be ready to administer the sacrament, especially in emergency situations. Is the practice rooted in scripture? Well, St. James tells us of the origins of this sacrament. We read, are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Now clearly James discerns a link between healing and forgiveness here. That is why the sacrament must be administered by a bishop or a priest. When used at the end of life, the anointing reminds us of Jesus' own anointing with oil before his suffering and death. What of the Old Testament? There are many Old Testament stories which point to the saving, healing and forgiving we associate with the sacrament. We think of Job, for instance, whose whole life falls apart, including his health. He endures and he is healed in the end. Now some, but not all, have stories of Job-like deliverance from illness. Why God heals some and not others is a troubling mystery at times. But all who suffer in body are called to trust in God, as Job did. We Catholics believe that salvation comes through the life-giving sacraments of the Church. And salvation is the ultimate healing of everything. It must also be remembered that healing, forgiveness and final salvation are available to everyone, but we have to follow God's way and not our own. The story of Naaman the Syrian is a memorable example. Naaman was a great military leader who suffered from leprosy. He heard of the healing power of Israel's God and he wanted some of that healing. The prophet Elisha cautioned him that God wasn't like a vending machine. This story of healing involves water and points us forward to baptism. And as we know from our earlier discussions, baptism is for everyone. And the lifelong growth and healing, along with access to the other sacraments, comes with it. These stories remind us that from the moment of Adam's disobedience in the Garden of Eden, God's many ways of healing the body and many promises of healing the whole person are signs of his faithfulness and closeness to us. And what about the New Testament? Well, in the New Testament, we see Jesus heal all kinds of people in all kinds of ways. The deaf, the lame, the possessed, the leprous, and even the dead. Very often, Jesus uses physical signs as he heals. Consider the case of the deaf man in Mark's Gospel. Jesus put his fingers into his ears and he spat and touched his tongue. And then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And likewise, in the Gospel of John, Jesus heals a blind man by the pool of Siloam. Other powerful examples include the raising of Jairus' daughter and the woman suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years. What is the Christian view of healing? Well, we do well to remember that healing is a much broader concept on the Christian view than most medical professionals would recognize or accept. We seek an holistic healing, which is physical, spiritual, and emotional. Jesus is not just a physician. He reveals the purpose of every kind of healing, which is to inspire faith. 
Faith is a key grace imparted by all the sacraments. When it comes to the anointing of the sick, healing is incomplete if not accompanied by growth in faith. Consider the story about the healing of the ten lepers. All ten are made clean, but only one expresses gratitude. Only one has faith. Only one is made well. Only one, the Samaritan, is both healed and saved. Our response to healing, therefore, is evangelistic. Our restoration is a sign of eternal life to come and inspires faith in others. It's also important to remember that we may not experience healing in the way we want or expect. Anointing of the sick strengthens our faith, filling our hearts with gratitude, enabling us to cope with illness in life-giving ways. Father, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, there's no easy answer to the mystery of suffering, and I'm not going to attempt to give one. What I will say is that there is nothing we or our loved ones go through in life that Jesus has not gone through first. When he is nailed to the cross out of love for you and me, he fulfills Isaiah's prophecy. Jesus is the suffering servant whose gift of healing is wrapped up in his taking upon him our sicknesses and infirmities. He forgives us, heals us, and saves us. Now, because he is one with us in our suffering and pain, we should never feel alone or abandoned. The experience of illness is also an opportunity for us to unite our suffering with our Lord's, perhaps even offering up the spiritual benefit for the needs of someone we love. This grace of the sacrament can often lift us out of our anguish and any temptation to self-absorption, despair or anger towards God. What do we do if we don't receive the healing that we pray for? The sacrament of the sick is the church's remedy to many ills, but it's not magic. We cannot demand of God something he would not otherwise give. When a priest administers the sacrament, he says, through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who frees you from sin, save you and raise you up. The grace is guaranteed, but the way God gives it is not prescribed in any one way. Any physical effects of the sacrament are only ever secondary to the experience of God's love. In this way, the anointing of the sick is a sacramental expression of thy will be done. Often people of an older generation speak of the last rites. What do they mean? Well, an important effect of the sacrament is that it prepares the dying for their final journey. We think here of the last rites or extreme unction, as it used to be called. And we can all think of moving stories of deathbed conversions, poor sinners who at the 11th hour repent and benefit from the graces of the sacraments as they make their final journey. It is important for any person who has come to life with Christ in the sacraments to be ushered into a natural death with Christ in a final sacrament. All of us should take good care to be fully prepared for God to call us home. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, I give you my heart and my soul. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, assist me in my last agony. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, may I breathe forth my soul in peace with you. Amen. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Understanding the Sacraments. We hope you enjoyed it. Join us next week when we'll be discussing the sacrament of marriage.